Congress passed a crummy law and the IRS administered it poorly and stupidly. Um, the, the crummy law argument seems weak to me in that the statute is 102 years old and the regulations have been in place interpreting the statute since 1959. So it's not as if this is all, this is all new stuff. You want to comment on the characterization of the IRS employees as poor, poorly and stupidly administering something? Well, one of the findings and recommendations of the Inspector General in his May 2013 report was that we should provide greater clarity in terms of the definition of what counts as political activity. Right now, our regulations, uh, which we uh, you know, are, are using, basically say you judge it by the facts and circumstances. And almost by definition, facts and circumstances is a somewhat unclear definition of what's political and what's not. So uh, one of the things we've been looking at uh, before I was confirmed, a re draft regulation went out that managed to aggravate everybody because it, it took the determination and included everything, including uh, get out the vote campaigns, voter registration, uh, candidate forums. And as we've been reviewing the 160,000 comments we've gotten, most of which had suggestions about how to improve that draft, it's clear that there is there are ways to make it clearer, easier for people running the organizations or wanting to set one up, and easier for the IRS to make determinations with less political oversight, less political involvement by the IRS. We ought not to be the political uh, monitors of the country. We ought to be actually implementing a statute as clearly as we can. Uh, obviously, uh, <clears throat> the primary standard and the facts and circumstances worked in the 40s, 50s, 60s, or in the 50s, this was put in in 1959 without a lot of controversy because there weren't a lot of organizations involved in uh, political activity. Right now, there are about 1,500 C4s. The vast majority of them are Kiwanis clubs, local garden clubs. The number of organizations has grown significantly in the last four or five years, but even then, they're still less than 10 percent. So I do think that we could provide clearer guidance, and we should provide clearer guidance. I understand that people think, well, you know, we're going to somehow try to influence the process. Our goal is not to influence the process. That's not our job. Our goal, as one of the people working on this with me said, our goal is not to change the strike zone, it's to dust off home plate and make it clearer what's in and what's out. What we found, though, at the committee level, in terms of our inquiry and the investigation and the, the work, the staff work, the interviews and so forth, is that it's a false claim to say that there was ambiguity. And that was, we, we didn't get that from the interviews that, that we did. And in fact, the, the, uh, the targeting took place Basically, when Washington came in and bigfooted the Cincinnati office and said, put a stop on those, put a hold on those. It wasn't Cincinnati that was having a problem of figuring out how to call the balls and strikes. It was Washington that came in and said, no, 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 we're, we're going to do this differently. So in your view, you know, to get to Mr. Rangel's question and to get to the question that came up at my meeting in Cincinnati where the IRS employee says, enough is enough. In your view, what caused the targeting to begin with? First of all, I, as I've said, and I've tried to make clear from the time I started, it was a situation a management failure should never have happened. Uh, it, selecting organizations for further review just by the name of the organization uh, is just the wrong way to go. But you acknowledge it was, a, it, was, it was a bad motive, right? I mean, it was clearly an agenda on the part of Lois Lerner to come in and, and to say, you know, were, and you've seen the emails. I mean, you're familiar with all this. I mean, common sense reading of these things and the sequence of them says there was an agenda here, and the agenda was to target people based on a particular philosophy. You agree with that, don't you? Uh, uh, I've said from the start there were six investigations undergoing when I started uh, GAO and IG have added another. So we've had eight investigations. I said at the start, uh, we're limited and, in, in fact, prohibited in many ways from doing our own investigation. So which one of the reasons I've uh, hope that we would get reports out and get the results out. My understanding by what I just read in the newspapers as much as anything is that the issue initially was raised in Cincinnati of we've got these in, a new influx of uh, organizations, what should we do with them? And they asked Washington for guidance. Washington took too long to respond and then the guidance back was uh, as they designed it. That, uh, but the too long to respond. But my point about it is it's not my role to have done the investigation. I'm delighted to have the findings that I understand the Senate Finance Committee in the next two or three weeks is going to issue its report with its findings. 
My position has been, our goal is not to do the investigation. There have been enough of those. Our goal is to listen to what the investigators find, and most importantly, listen to what their recommendations are. We've adopted the I recommendations. Understand. The but, ID, I mean, and if so there are more recommendations, we'll review those and adopt the ones we can. Mr. Well. Rangel is begging for mercy. He wants the movie to stop, and you can stop the movie. You can be the one that says, hey, it's all over. We acknowledge that there was targeting that took place, which is a huge, a huge acknowledgement, which the, which the IRS has never done up until this point. In the we subsequent have. meeting that I had with the leadership in Cincinnati, they were using <clears throat> the words alleged, alleged, alleged. And I just think that's part of the, that's part of the underlying, that's part of the subtext here. It's like enough already. So. Um, it was late February 2010, a screener in Cincinnati began to flag Tea Party applications for his superiors' attention because of possible media interest. So there's not a, it, it was not an element of confusion, but my point is, <clears throat> if we want the movie to stop, if we want to move on to the next thing, it is incredibly helpful to acknowledge that there was targeting that took place and the targeting was based on a bad motive and there was an agenda behind it. And I think that it would just be incredibly helpful for th that to be acknowledged. Would you be willing to acknowledge that today? Uh, we've had this discussion before. We have acknowledged and apologized for the fact that the process as it unfolded took place. Those organizations, first of all, C4s don't need a determination. They can go and set up business anytime they want. But to the extent they want a determination so it ratifies what they say they're going to do as being uh, acceptable under C4, they deserved a prompt, much prompter answer. They deserved not to be uh, har harassed with voluminous questions. It was a process that was a mistake, and we've apologized for that mistake. The characterization and the determination of whether there was a, quote, motive uh, is a determination that we aren't in a position to make. There's no evidence that I have that certainly the IRS as an organization was not motivated in that regard. So we have apologized. I've said that situation should never happen again. But it's not in my uh, realm of the information I have to determine that, well, it was, quote, targeting or not. Uh, and the reason uh, if you talk to the employees who were there, the reason they talk about it as alleged is they don't, in their own mind, think they were targeting anybody. Uh, they were simply trying, and it, the mistake was a serious and significant one. Organizations should not be selected by the nature of their name, the nature of their political views, the nature of the activities they want to be going on. We have a million and a half tax-exempt organizations. They are, as uh, uh, Congressman uh, Lewis said, providing significant public support and activities across a wide range of activities. There are issue advocacy groups out there advocating on positions for and against all sorts of issues and political issues. We shouldn't it, be involved in that determination. When it comes down to it, though, I guess, I guess the, the part, and, and let me just make one other point, and then I've got some other questions. But I think the part, the, the, the disconnect is <clears throat> you're basically saying, look, someone was treated poorly and a process was bad. What we're saying is someone was treated poorly and a process was bad and it was manipulated by somebody with a motive to cause injury and it's a classic abuse of power. So your reluctance to use the word targeting and simply act as if, well, look, these were just people that happened to end up on the wrong end of a bureaucratic stick. It's more than that. They're not just people that ended up, you know, waiting too long, you know, in a line or mistreated, you know, treated rudely or something at a counter. These are people who, in organizations that were asserting a First Amendment right, that senior officials at the Internal Revenue Service said, we're going to manipulate this process to deny you the right to participate in the public square. And that's the scandal of it. And to Mr. Rangel's point, the reason he's begging for mercy is because he says, when is enough enough? He's asking the same question. And what I'm suggesting is, you're the key to being enough enough. I would disagree. The key to that is there were six investigations investigating just that point. And those investigations have spent a numerable amount of time. We spent $20 million giving people information about it. We expect the Finance Committee make, says, it indicated it's going to be bipartisan. They will issue a report and they will make a determination about that based on a review of a million five hundred thousand pages of documents that I have not reviewed. It's not my position to preempt them as to whether this was 
targeting or not, whether it was manipulation, whether it was politically motivated or not. We will hear from people writing those reports. The Permanent Subcommittee on Investigation issued its report last year, uh, not a bipartisan report, in which the majority said they did not find that there was targeting and it was politically motivated. The minority said they thought it was. We will see what the Finance uh, Committee does. I have always felt it is not my role to preempt those investigations and conclude one way or the other. What we can conclude is that the process itself, however it was started, was a bad process. It shouldn't have happened. People should not have been treated that way. People should be treated fairly, no matter who they are. We are committed to that. We have apologized to the extent that people were not treated that way. Whatever the motivation was, uh, are, we're committed that it won't happen again. Let's move on. Just a couple other questions. Um, <clears throat> this is on the idea of this being a, a hypothetical risk. So let me pose a hypothetical situation. Um, let's say that the person who is the gatekeeper at the IRS who reviews complaints, for example, about faith-based organizations <clears throat> is pro-life and opposes groups that support abortion. If that person at the IRS wanted to make it more difficult for pro-choice groups, couldn't the employee recommend that those groups be audited? Any a single employee cannot, as you know, and the processes in GA by themselves recommend an audit. To the extent that they are, and if they are going to recommend an audit, someone in the classifiers or in our process of where are the issues, they have to justify and document why they are recommending that audit. In any high profile issue where it is an issue of advocacy of one kind or another, that would go, by definition, to a three-party review group that itself would make a determination whether there is a course and a reason for an exam and a basis for that. Okay. Let us break that down. So based on your, based on your response, <clears throat> the first thing is they would be able to make a recommendation for an audit to the Audit Committee. So my original That's, question and, and it goes the, back to the that. answer would hypothetical. be hypothetical. They could do that. The, and GAO, the answer would be the GAO talked to over 40 people and found all of them committed to fairness in the process. So none of those people would fit that hypothetical. Well, look, if you're being interviewed by the GAO, of course you're going to say I'm 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 committed to fairness in the process. So my original question was, could that person? <clears throat> make a referral to the Audit Committee? And the answer is yes. An individual would, could make a referral uh, across the board with a memorandum and a justification as why there is an audit issue. So to follow up on Mr. Meehan's inquiry, though, on, on the documentation side, up until now, with not enough documentation, they can just make the, they could make a referral under current practice they could not write down why they have made that referral, and then it, it is before the Audit Committee. Is that right? The Audit Committee, and the Audit Committee gets a full file, as the GAO said, and the fact that there is a summary or not a summary uh, would be noted, and it would be up to the three-party independent group randomly selected now to determine whether there is a basis for an audit. And so just so we are clear, um, this obviously cuts both ways. So if you are somebody that was um, uh, had had a liberal agenda, and you're the gatekeeper. You you would have the ability to have an influence if somebody um, has a you know an issue as it relates to gas tax or climate change or this or that. That gatekeeper that that is determinative for the audit committee. That's a key person, isn't that right? That's a classifier. I know on high profile is one that makes uh, classifies the things and refers them. Uh, for audit selection. All right. Um, I just want to pop up this learner email just very quickly. So um, if we can put that back up, where Lois Lerner um, says, I think I need to think about whether to open an exam. I think, yes, let me cogitate on it a bit. I mean, any fair reading of that is that <clears throat> that that's an attempt to come in over the top and influence the process. There's, there's no way in the process she could open an exam. There's no way in the process today anyone by themselves can, in that situation, open an exam. But her state of mind, obviously, was that she thought she could. Uh, that could be. But anyway, the process is that not a single individual could not, particularly in a high profile case, open an exam. Let me just turn your attention then to um, one other subject briefly, and that is the, the hearing that we had on civil forfeiture. You recall that um, we, uh, as a subcommittee, were, were like-minded, and um, it was, you, you testified about the IRS's activity in the past as it relates to civil forfeitures from uh, 
seizing of assets from businesses that didn't have an underlying, um, an underlying illegal activity. We heard from other than the, uh, the structuring itself. Other than the structuring, which itself is the illegal. Yep. Would, uh, so what I, what I thought I said was underlying, but I, okay. I, I take your correction. Um, one of the witnesses was Randy Sowers, and he's currently participating or petitioning the government to return $29,500 he forfeited to the government in order to um, get the IRS out of his life. And I wanted to call it to your attention because the Department of Treasury has discretion to return those funds. Um, and I just want to communicate that it's my hope and my expectation that Treasury returns those funds um, that the IRS seized and also any funds connected to cases that are similarly situated that we had discussed. I, I would just make a technical point that when cases in seizure are, <clears throat> the seizure goes through the courts. Once they're in the courts, uh, it's a Department of Justice decision, not an IRS or Treasury decision. So in cases recently where uh, there's been publicity about uh, refunds being made. Those are determinations made by the Department of Justice, not I the take IRS. Your, I, I take your point. Would you be willing to, uh, to the extent that you've got the ability to, to support the petition for the release of those funds? Uh, as I say, we've, as you know, changed our policy uh, last year. We no longer seize those funds to the extent that they were seized and not representing underlying uh, uh, issues. Uh, you know, we, th we think that if we wouldn't seize them now, uh, that we don't see any reason you wouldn't return those funds. So moving forward, would you be willing to, to, to communicate to the Secretary of the Treasury that you're like-minded on that and you would support uh, right. the Again, it's of those not the funds? Secretary of Treasury who controls this. It's the Department of Justice and the prosecutors who determine what to be, what's to be done in those doesn't, cases. Doesn't Treasury, I mean, this is a technical point, doesn't Treasury have, have control over them? You're saying it's DOJ? No. DOJ. Once it goes into the court system, it's a DOJ. The U.S. attorneys and the people prosecuting that case uh, negotiate with the uh, defendants and make those decisions. Okay. Would you be willing to support or reach out to the, uh, the attorney general on that basis? Uh, again, we don't know the details of each of those cases, but as a general matter, uh, our, our position has been that at this point, even though it's a violation of the law to structure your deposits, we're not seizing and, and are no longer, it's our policy no longer to seize those assets unless the underlying funds are derived from criminal activities, whether it's drug running or forfeiture. I understand. Thank you both for your testimony and your time today. Appreciate it. Thank you and thank member of the committee. Let's invite up our next witnesses.